This is a holy moment. The Spirit of God is in this place. It's a divine appointment to meet with the face to face. This is an invitation. Good morning, everyone. Sorry about that. Uh, I couldn't get that microphone to come on. It wasn't even a colorblind issue this time. It just wouldn't come on. Can you hear me? Number one. There you go. All right. Am I on now? Yeah. Whew. All right. Got a bunch of announcements today, so I got to quit wasting time. Uh, do we have some slide? Do we have a slide? Any slides other than the memory verse? Oh, okay. We'll start with the fall festival. That's where the bulk of our announcements lie. But before I get there, I I have heard a rumor that tomorrow is Shirley's birthday. Shirley, happy birthday, Shirley.
Um, and before we jump into this, I'm going to turn it over to Miss Carrie. Um, she has an announcement regarding our Christian school. Good morning, church. Um, our school is in full swing um, for this year, and we have 39 kids that attend, and that is 23 families and seven different school districts represented in our Christian school. Um, yes, what a blessing. And as you all know, we work on a very tight budget up there because we want as many kids in our community as possible to be able to receive a Christian education. So we are doing something we've never really done before, but this month we are doing a fundraiser. And all of our families have these calendars. And if you guys would like to support our Christian school, you can donate a date on this calendar. So you're like, what does that even mean? So if you find any students that attend our church, if you attend Chapel Hill Christian Academy, can you stand up? So go, yep, wave your hands. You can see all of our little students here that attend that are in here this morning. They all have a calendar. And you can come up and maybe your wedding anniversary is on, like our wedding anniversary is September 24th. So I might say, I want to donate uh, the 24th. So I would give $24 to that student um, to go towards our school. And once I did that, my name and phone number would go on this calendar on the 24th. Um, if you donate a date, so if you love July 4th, you can say, I want to give $4 for the 4th. Your name goes on the 4th. So you kind of see how it works. Um, once you donate, we'll put your name and phone number on this calendar, and you're going to be entered into a drawing for one of five gift cards um, at the end of October. And if a family fills out a whole calendar, that will give $496 to our school. Times that by 23 families. Um, you don't have to give a ton, obviously, but it will be a major, major blessing to our Christian school and just enable us to do activities with the kids, um, make bigger purchases that we're in need of, and things like that. So if you would like to support our Christian school, you can give in cash, check, um, or we even have a QR code on these calendars. And if you have the cash app, you can scan it and give that way. Um, so just wanted to let you all know that this was going on, and if you would like to donate, it would be greatly appreciated. So thank you. I want to say two things about that. Um, since I am involved somewhat in the school, I've said this before, and this is no knock on Mount Vernon City Schools, which I worked for for years. We have five teachers that work at our school. If you combine their salary, they make less than a brand new teacher for Mount Vernon City Schools. So when Carrie says we operate on a lean budget, she means it. So anything you could give would be a blessing to us. Also, I have something to say, and you guys should cheer for this because we now need the biggest playground on demand for our school because we can put it wherever we want on these 17.5 acres. And speaking of events that are going to be on this new property, the Fall Festival is rapidly approaching. It will be here in two weeks. Please continue to pray over this event and invite people. You can pass out posters and invitations that are found at the back table. Connie has gone so far as to make different invitations for different ages of people. Here is a general invitation to the fall festival that you can pick up. John's going to have all kinds of notes for his message today. Here is an invitation for teens that you can pick up at the back table. Here is an invitation for 50 plus that you can invite them for the different activities that will be available for them. And here is an invitation for the pet costume portion of the evening. So there is a variety of invitations. You can pick them up at the back table, pass them out to the appropriate age group so we can fill this 17.4.5-ish acres that God has blessed us with. Also, 
There's a sheet in the back showing if you have volunteered what your job will be on that night. And if you're like, huh, I don't even know what that means. There's also a contact person. So if you signed up, you're going to volunteer and you're like, I don't know what I have to do that night. You can contact your contact person and they will give you the information you need so that you will be ready for that evening. And if you haven't signed up, we are still looking for volunteers. And here's the unfortunate part. Unfortunately, and I'm not trying to manipulate you, I'm just telling you the truth. Unfortunately, if we don't get enough volunteers, there are certain activities we will have to just not have that night. So please, if you can, sign up. We will put you to work for just one hour that evening, and you'll be able to enjoy the rest of the time. And some of you are like, I'm used to coming to Trunk or Treat. I just want to do that. If you sign up, Connie will not only take care of you, she will tell you your exact parking space on that night so you know exactly where to go and park, and then you can get out of here if you want to. But we need everybody to be all hands on deck for the fall festival. I'm moving on. I don't know if we have other screens. I'm a mess today. We do have other screens. Okay, so we'll get to that at the end. Uh, the men's breakfast is returning to the church. I believe that's going to be the first time in a long time we're going to have the men's breakfast actually be in the church. They meet every Saturday. Not every Saturday at the church, though. If you have any questions, you can see Ted Whitney. He will take care of you. But November 4th will be a special day. November 4th, they will be back here at 8 a.m., at the church, having breakfast and fellowship and having a brief lesson from Mr. Whitney, I believe. Sound about right? Matthew Hawk is speaking, so we'll get a lesson from Matthew Hawk. So be here, November 4th. November 16th is Praise and Pie. Mark your calendars for that. That's an evening event. If you have any questions, you can ask Pastor John, Miss Carrie, anyone. Um, should be able to hook you up with information on that. The 9th, December 9th, sorry, whew, I'm trying to go fast, is the Christmas banquet at Dear Dutchman. We have Eli and Ashley speaking. We have Reagan and Brock performing the music. Sign up at the Connection Center. Again, that is December 9th, if you're interested. And last but not least, December 17th is the Christmas concert. I said last but not least, but I was wrong. I have a letter here from Starting Point thanking this congregation for donating $1,105.48 to Starting Point to help save the lives of innocent children. What a blessing. Uh, in total, they raised over $26,000. So this community is definitely in the pro-life battle, and so is this church. And speaking of that, you say, oh, goodness, he's going to get political. Well, I'm actually not going to be getting political. I'm going to be getting biblical. Because this issue one that is out there, you may have seen one of the people in our congregation passing out signs today. This is not the same issue one that you voted a certain way if you were voting Christian in the last election. This is a different issue one. This is not one that we're going to vote yes for if we're voting from a Christian perspective. Because this is going to... Ohio's had a heartbeat law. This is going to wipe it off the books. This is going to allow abortions up to birth. And that's just not something we can get behind. I mean, that's just unbiblical, all of it. So look into it, and I'll say something that Pastor Dan used to say when he was standing up here. Vote Christian. Do your research and vote Christian. Vote your Bible. Don't be confused because it has the same name and same number as the one that just happened last voting season. So this is a pro-life church because our God is pro-life, okay? All I think I have left is our memory verse, and then we will pray. So would you say this with me? Light is shown for the righteous and gladness for the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. Amen. I believe that is it. If I miss something, I so apologize. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. We'll pray for Pastor John as he brings the message. We'll pray for the offering. You can put your offering over in those plates over there. And we'll pray for our continued worship of the Lord. Father, we just come before you so grateful that we can enter your house, Lord and fulfill what your word calls us to do, which is to fear God, to worship you, 
to bring glory and honor to your name. Father, I pray that as we continue to worship today, that it would be a blessing, Lord, to your ears, Lord, as we lift up your name, Lord, that it would bless our hearts because we are walking in obedience to you. Father, as Pastor John brings the message today, I have a feeling he's going to be on fire today because he's got the chance to be around other pastors all week. Lord, may his message penetrate our hearts, Lord, and may we leave here, if we're believers, more sanctified, closer to who you want us to be, Lord. And if there's anyone here who doesn't know you, I pray that their hearts would be touched, that seeds would be planted and watered, and that they would surrender their lives to you. Father, I pray that you would bless the offering, Lord. You have blessed this church so mightily in this season. May we use it in every inch of land to bring glory and honor to your name. And Father, we pray all of these things in the powerful, holy name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. If it's bandaging the broken, washing filthy
a blessing to have just people of the next generation stepping up and stepping out and saying, here I am, Lord, send me. I'm just so thankful. I think of the hymn that just says, here I am, Lord, here I am. I give all myself to you. Here I am. Um, That was actually the song I walked down the aisle to, (laughs) just in praising the Lord and saying that I wanted to give my marriage and my life to the Lord and what he had for us. And today, we're just in in praise of all that God has done, all of the things that, that he has blessed us with. Our whole church, just this week, as we came into possession of this land, we're just in awe of, of what God has done and what he is doing. And um, this morning I was reading and the scripture that came to me was Proverbs 16, three, and it said, commit to the Lord whatever you do and your plans will succeed. And God, if we are giving it all to him, if our plans sync up and line up with what he wants, then they're going to succeed. We will not fail because he has something greater. He wants his glory to be known in all the earth. Will you stand with us as we sing about the goodness of God? I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me, and all my days I've been held in your hands, from the moment that I wake
take your Bibles and turn to Isaiah chapter 25. Also, it's already been mentioned, a new face up here, and I'm thankful for uh, Kaylee Foreman and for her utilizing her gifts and just thankful uh, for all of the blessing and talent that is in this place. Isaiah chapter 25, we'll begin reading in verse 1. The inscription over this scripture in God's Word is praise to God. Verse 1. O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name, for you have done wonderful things. Your counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. For you have made a city a ruin, a fortified city a ruin, a palace of foreigners to be a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, the strong people will glorify you. The city of the terrible nations will fear you, for you have been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shade from the heat. For the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall. You will reduce the noise of aliens As heat in a dry place, as heat in the shadow of a cloud, the song of the terrible ones will be diminished. And in this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of choice pieces, a feast of wines on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of well-refined wines on the lees. And he will destroy on this mountain the surface of the covering cast over all people, and the veil that is spread over all nations. Verse 8. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. The rebuke of His people He will take away from the earth, for the Lord has spoken. And it will be said in that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for Him, and He will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for Him. We will be glad and rejoice in His salvation. For on this mountain the hand of the Lord will rest, and Moab shall be trampled down under him, as straw is trampled down for the refuse heap. And he will spread out his hands in their midst. As a swimmer reaches out to swim, 
And he will bring down their pride together with the trickery of their hands. The fortress of the high fort of your walls he will bring down, lay low, and bring to the ground, down to the dust. Father, we give you glory for your word. We thank you that yours is a great story. We're thankful that we are a part of it. We can sing of your goodness and your grace and your blessing. Lord, I pray today for each soul sitting in this hallowed place, this sacred place, this sanctuary of, that is to be holy before the Lord. And God, that we would come to you with clean hands and pure hearts. Lord, if there are those that are discouraged today, we pray that you would encourage them as they follow you. If there are those in this sitting in this holy place who are living unholy lives, who are intentionally or maybe unintentionally or being deceived by the enemy and they are living in sin, Lord, I pray today you would convict them of their sin. The Lord, they would not stay in that distant place from you. But that, as you said in James, draw near to you and you will draw near to us. Lord, that we can come before you with a, with a pure heart, with a clean conscience, Lord, knowing that you do not bless people who live in purposeful sin. You do not pour out your favor. You do not give your spirit to people who are purposefully rejecting your word. And who are on purpose saying, I'm going to do it my way. Lord, you, you do not fill people with gritted teeth. Lord, you fill people, you bless people, you help people, you forgive people who have open hearts and unclenched fists and they say, Jesus, I need you. Help me. And Lord, as we are part of your great story, may we be a part of it in a right way, with a right mind, with the right spirit. Lord Jesus, we ask for you to move in this place today. Move in power. May we experience your presence. And Lord, may we not walk out of here. Shame on us if we walk out of here the same as we came in. Shame on us if we're focused on the weather. Shame on us if we're focused on all of our issues and our problems. Shame on us if we're focused on our feelings. Shame on us if we're focused on anything but you, this is your house. This is your time. This is your word. Speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. And we ask this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Last Sunday, the theme of our 28th anniversary was stories. And man, was it good. A lot of great stories <clears throat> and of God's faithfulness to this church since it began. And those stories focus mostly on the, the, the Lord's blessing and the stories of our people in this place, in this context. But I mentioned a scripture last week in my message. Uh, it was in this chapter and it tells of God's great story. We've been going through a series, God's Great Plan. We've been talking about the purpose, the mission, the values. Now we've gotten into the vision. And Lord willing, I will resume that here in the next couple of weeks. But we adjusted the title from God's Great Plan to God's Great Story to go along with our theme for the next couple of Sundays. And this chapter that we've just read gives uh, not just our story... But it gives the whole story. It gives the, not only the beginning, but it gives the end game and the story from God's eternal perspective. And I, I, I just, uh, my heart burns today that it will be a great encouragement and deepen your trust and your hope in the Lord. And you will leave today with a deeper knowledge and a better understanding of our God and the great story that he has written and is writing let me give you a little background on this scripture. Isaiah 25, when the prophet Isaiah began to preach and begin his ministry, it was in 740 B.C., so 700 plus years before Christ was born. And Israel was at a crisis point in its history. 
God's people were experiencing both religious and moral compromise. So the Lord commissioned his prophet, Isaiah, to call God's people to repent of their wicked ways and to trust in him alone for their salvation, to turn from sin. And uh, in doing that, he would give them deliverance from their enemies. In this book, Isaiah often highlights many of God's attributes. Isaiah is chock full. If you say, I want to know, get to know who God is better, go to Isaiah. It talks so much about his holiness and his power. And there are many highs and lows that are also shown in Israel's experience in this book. Both God's pardon and his judgment. God's blessing and his cursing. God's mercy and his wrath. Well, one of the elements that I love in this story, in this book, is Isaiah's foretelling of what is yet to come. What is yet to come for the people of God in the future. And in this present day, like Israel, in Isaiah's day, our own nation is experiencing both religious and moral compromise. Hence, vote no one as you want. And stand for life. America has lost her way. We have. We have lost all sense of good and right and common sense. And we are living in dark, evil, confusing days. It even seems more evident that we are indeed living in the last days. Uh, and as Christians, as Christ followers, it can, it can get confusing. But it can get disorienting and discouraging and defeating even at times. But Isaiah 25 is here to help write and correct and adjust our hearts to God's perspective. Because Isaiah 25 that we just read is Christ, it is the story of Christ's reign and rule after the great tribulation when he establishes his millennial kingdom and reigns for a thousand years. And it is an encouraging reminder, it is an encouraging reminder to keep our eyes on the Lord Knowing that one day we will be victorious in Jesus. Amen, Shirley? Oh, victory in Jesus. That's what, this, that's what this chapter is about. And even though this scripture, it is eschatological and apocalyptic. It's, it's speaking of days in the future and the end times. We are still able to apply, apply much of the reality of this chapter to today. And we can say with Isaiah as we just read, Behold, this is our God. Behold, this is our God. And he has a great story to tell. So the first thing I want to mention out of this is our God is unfailing. Look again at verse 1 in Isaiah 25. It says, O Lord, you are my God. Can you say, can you say that this morning? Not that just, he is God, that, but that he is your God. He is my God. O Lord, you are my God, I will exalt you. I will praise your name, for you have done wonderful things. Your counsels, this is also the word for plans. Your plans of old are faithfulness and truth. So first, I just want to tell you, be encouraged. Be encouraged with this, that the plans that the Lord set in place, even before the foundations and the creation of the world, all of his plans, all of his counsels, they are falling right into position. You say, it doesn't feel that way. Hey, trust him. His plans, his counsels are falling right into place, right on time, with perfect precision. Could have had more amens there. God's story... From the very beginning of time is falling right into position, right on time with perfect precision. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Thank you. With all of the unsettledness and chaos swirling around us, the Bible says here, even from the beginning, but even now, God is still doing wonderful things. The prophet said, God, you are still faithful and true. And God is still worthy of our trust and our exaltation and our worship and our praise. For our God is unfailing. God writes the story and his story will not fail. Secondly, in God's great story, 
our God is unafraid. Look again at verse 2. It says, for you have made a city a ruin. A fortified city, a strong city, a powerful city, a powerful ungodly city, a ruin. A palace of foreigners to be a city no more. This is people that have rejected God, that are not part of God's family. A palace of foreigners to be a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, the strong people will glorify you. Now, we're not going to get into this, but this is telling of how God is going to turn the hearts of these wicked, unrepentant sinners towards himself, and they are going to become worshipers. It says, therefore, the strong people will glorify you. The city of the terrible nations will fear you. For you have been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shade from the heat. For the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm. A storm's coming. For the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall. You will reduce the noise of aliens, that's foreigners, away from God. As heat in a dry place, as heat in the shadow of a cloud. The song of the terrible ones, they're singing now. They are chanting, they're marching the streets, they're having riots. They're they're singing their song. The Bible says that song is going to be silenced and it's going to be diminished and it's going to come to its demise. Our God is unafraid. When Isaiah is talking here about cities and nations and enemies here in the scripture, he is speaking in generic terms of all people uh, and all nations and authorities who reject and rebel against God. Look again at the negatives in verses 2 through 5. You see, strong peoples, Rejecting God, fighting against His people, ruthless nations. You think of what we're experiencing now in our world across the sea over in Israel and Hamas and these ruthless nations killing women and babies and infants in horrific ways and and raping Christians and and just ascending in all of these rockets and all of the, the... The carnage that is taking place while we sit here in heat and in padded chairs and in lights. And people right now are huddled crying out for God's mercy. But that's what was happening here. Strong peoples, ruthless nations. People are in poverty. They're needy. They're in distress. They're in a storm. There's heat. The breath of the ruthless. It's like, man, you can feel feel evil on the back of your neck. And then again, it talks about a storm and heat twice. And then it's a dry place. And then the noise of foreigners. Man, all the noise, the noise, the noise of social media and TV and the radio. And, and, and just, it's just, do you, ever, do you ever just take great delight in turning the stupid technology off? Man, you need that. I was traveling back from New York this week. I took a camping chair and I thought, I'm going to be riding along Lake Ontario. Been to Lake Erie? Chop, chop. I love that place, but man, whoo, up and down. You, you get your, your dance on there. But I, I haven't been to New York since I was two. Never remembered it, obviously. I'm driving them back all the way. And the, for about two hours, I just, I could see Lake Ontario. And I finally came to a national park. I pulled over pit stop. I went and saw Tim and Katie Swift and their family. She fixed me a meal. I stayed the night there. We had such a great time. But before I got there, about 25 miles, there's this little national park sitting on a hill. And I went, took my camping chair, took my Bible, and I sat there and I watched. It's like Lake Placid. You got the rough waters of Erie, but then Lake Ontario is just just calm. And I sat there and I said, Behold... This is our God. And all the while, all this chaos is being stirred up in our world. God is seated high upon the throne, high and lifted up. The Bible says His train fills the temple and He's sitting there over a calm lake as a testimony that He is in complete control. And He's absolutely unafraid of what is happening in our world right now. What about you? That's quite a list that he mentions. Heat, the song of the ruthless, strong peoples, ruthless nations. Do you have do you have a list? You say, Well, I've never written a list down, but like my papa Wister said, we don't we don't need to memorize uh, 
we don't need to make a list. He said, you need to write out your praise list, but you don't need to write out your gripe list because you've got it memorized. <clears throat> but here the Bible says, our God is unafraid. I wrote down a, a, a short list of things that can bring fear to my heart or bother me or trouble me. But what this, what Isaiah is saying in this verse is this. There is no adversary. There is no army. There is no assault, attack, anguish, anxiety, or abomination. There is no battle. Teens, there is no bully. No brokenness, burden, bondage, betrayal, or baggage. No challenge, catastrophe, cancer, crime, cover-up. Captivity, chains, curse, or chaos. There is no devil, no demon, no discouragement, disappointment, depression, darkness, drug, disease, decay, discomfort, deformity, division, defeat, divorce, devastation, death, or demise. There is no enemy, epidemic, emperor, empire, election, or evil. There is no famine, fear, fright, fight, force, failure, or foe. There is no government, guilt, giant. There is no golf ball. There is no germ or grave. There is no hurt, harm, heartache, heartbreak, handicap, hardship, horror, or hell. There is no issue, injury, incarceration, indictment, injustice, institution, or ideology. There is no judge, jury, or jail. There's no king or kingdom, no loss, loneliness, load, legislation, or law. There's no mystery, misery, menace, mob, malice, monarch, or matriarch. There's no narcissist, nemesis, or nation, no obstacle, opponent, or oppression, no pain, pit, past, poverty, plight, persecution, punishment, pandemic, prodigal, prison, power, philosophy, perplexity, politician, there is no prince, president, or princess, no quiz, quandary, or queen. There's no religion, racism, rebellion, riot, rejection, or redefinition. There is no sickness, sorrow, suffering, sadness, separation, struggle, storm, scare, scar, stain, substance, Satan, or sin. There is no theory, trial, test, travail, tumor, terror, terrorist, trouble, turmoil, travesty, tragedy, thief, or tomb. There is no university or union. There is no vice, valley, vermin, violence, or victor. There is no wickedness, no weapon, no woe, no worry, and no war. And there are no words that start with X, Y, and Z that you can think up of on your own time which are able to overwhelm, overcome, overtake the Lord because He is our God and our God Woo! He is unafraid. That's who our God is. He's unafraid. Pardon me while I take a sip. <clears throat> I want you to turn to Psalm chapter 27. Psalm 27. Verse 1, say, man, I've got anxiety today. I'm, I'm fearful today. Here's a good one for you. David said, the Lord is my light. I'm in darkness. I'll get to the light. The Lord is my light. I'm lost. Well, and get to your salvation. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and my foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. Man, if the, what a list to be, to be fearful. But he said, I'm confident. I'm motivated. Because verse 4 says, One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His holy temple. For in the time of trouble He shall hide me in His pavilion. In the secret place of His tabernacle He shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. On Christ the solid rock we stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Verse 6, And now... 
My head shall be lifted up. I'm going to stop having a pity party. It'll be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy. I'm tired of being a sad sap and a sour grape. And I'm going to lift my eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. And I'm going to worship the Lord with joy in His tabernacle. I will sing. Yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Who are you afraid of if the Lord is your God? Stay right there. It just came to me, Psalm 23. And look at, well, let's just go for it. Verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, I lack nothing. He makes me to lie down in green pastures, there's rest and peace. He leads me beside the still waters, there's comfort. He restores my soul. He renews the inner man. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil. Rob, your cup is running over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. That means they shall hound you. These are the hounds of heaven. They're on your trail. God's mercy and His goodness. I've seen the evidence of your mercy all over my life. <clears throat> Surely goodness and mercy shall hound me. They shall follow me. They shall be on my trail and on my tail all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever and ever and ever. And all of God's people said, Amen. Because our God, He is unafraid. Third, in God's great story, our God is unceasing. Go back to Isaiah 25 and look at verse 6. It says, And in this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of choice pieces, a feast of the finest food, a feast of wines on the leaves, the finest liquid and drinks. Of the fat things full of marrow of well-refined wines on the lees. One of these days, the Lord is going to supply all of our needs with not just what is adequate and sufficient, but He's going to give to us the best of the best of the best that He has created for all of eternity. And the goods will never run out, never run dry, never run short on me and you. But I want to just pause and say this morning, as we're excited and encouraged about this scripture, in order for you to experience God's unceasing provision in the future, this mountain that he's talking about where we're going to gather and worship the Lord together, that's in the future. But in order to experience God's unceasing provision in the future, you must first receive God's unceasing mercy and grace in the present. You've got to know His grace, His salvation, His forgiveness. You've got to know it now on this mount called Vernon. If you want to know it on that mountain in the future. John chapter 6 verse 35, it says, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. And he who believes in me shall never thirst. He will unceasingly fill you. John chapter 4 verse 14, Jesus said, Whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain, <laughs> a never-ending fountain springing up into everlasting life. John chapter 7 verses 37 and 38, Jesus cried out. He cries out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Our God is unceasing in his grace and in his provision to us. And I will say again, if you want to experience the meal on this mountain in the future, 
You must experience the bread of life right now in the present. You're not going to eat on that mountain if you've not taken and received and believed in Jesus Christ in this earthly life. You must get to Mount Calvary. If you want to eat on that mountain, you must come to the water of life on Mount Calvary. You must come to Christ's cross and receive His salvation. Fourthly, our God is undefeated. Our God is unafraid. Our God is unceasing. Our God is undefeated. Look at verse 7 in Isaiah 25. And he will destroy on this mountain the surface of the covering cast over all people. It's like we've got just this massive veil covering over us. And the veil that is spread over all nations of sin and brokenness and poverty and heartache and heartbreak and death and divorce and disease. Look at verse 8. He will swallow up death forever. The King James says, He shall swallow up death in victory. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. The rebuke of His people He will take away. <laughs> We're so stained and tarnished and He's going he's to wipe it all away. He will take away from all the earth for the Lord has spoken. And it will be said in that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for Him and He will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for Him. We will be glad and rejoice in His salvation. Our God is undefeated. In John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Our God is undefeated because he is the resurrection and the life. In 1997, after 48 years of marriage, my grandmother, Mamal, Wisner, her name was Phyllis, Levi's wife. She died suddenly of a brain aneurysm. It was just when we just were starting our church and we were still meeting out in the front chapel. And after Mamaw died, being on a ventilator for six days, they turned the machine off and her body, we believe, met her spirit. She was already with the Lord and, and she was with God. Well, we put... Uh, the grandkids on a rotation to stay with Papa. We'd never been alone like that. So we each took a week and Danny and Heather and different ones of us older um, cousins, we went and stayed with Papa for a week. And I'll never forget Papa in grief and in sorrow and in brokenness and in turmoil and loneliness. And he coined this little phrase. I don't, I don't know... I would assume it just, it just came to his heart from the Lord. And from the very first day to the last day that I left, he would get up and you could just see the weight on him. But he would, he would tune his heart to sing God's grace. And he would say this phrase, praise the Lord. And he would clap. Phyllis is victorious in Jesus. Praise the Lord. Phyllis is victorious in Jesus. Praise the Lord. We'd be going, we'd be driving to make a, a visit to someone in need. Hey, Papa, uh, where do we, just break in, interrupt me. Praise the Lord. Phyllis is victorious in Jesus. Praise the Lord. Phyllis is victorious in Jesus. Sunday morning, we'd be getting ready to go over and preach at the little church and we'd be getting on our our worship is best we knew how in that little white house. And there's Papa by himself. Praise the Lord. Phyllis is victorious in Jesus. And that kept his heart reminded again and again that although he felt defeated and discouraged, he served a God. 
who is undefeated and who will get us the victory. Sixteen years later on September 13th, uh, or yeah, 2013, Papaw took his last breath. He was at Knox Community Hospital. And Dad and I went in to the hospital and there Papa was on the bed. And we prayed and Dad's sisters were there and then they, we all went out and I slipped back into the room just by myself and I walked up to Papa's body and I knelt down beside him and I said, Praise the Lord. <laughs> Levi is victorious in Jesus. Praise the Lord. Levi is victorious in Jesus. Praise the Lord. Levi is victorious in Jesus. And I'm telling you this morning, some of you are discouraged and lonely and broken and defeated. And you're divorced or you're discouraged or you've lost a son or a daughter or a spouse. Or you've lost a friendship. But I want to tell you this morning... God, one of these days, is going to bring it all together. He's going to right every wrong. He's going to heal every disease. He's going to mend every broken heart. You hold on. You wait for the Lord because He is our salvation. Our God is undefeated. And we can sing, there is coming a day when no heartache shall come. No more clouds in the sky no more tears to dim the eyes. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day that will be. And what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see, when I look upon His face, the one who saved me by His grace, when He takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day! Glorious day that will be. Well, Mark's standing. I say we sing that one more time. And what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon His face. The one who saved me by His grace. When He takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day that will be. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. We've got to finish the story. <laughs> I've worked too hard on this message. <laughs> Lastly, our God is unavoidable. God, the King of kings, Lord of lords, Prince of princes, Master. He is unavoidable. Look at Isaiah chapter 25 verse 10. It says, for on this mountain the hand of the Lord will rest, and Moab shall be trampled down under him, as straw is trampled down for the refuse, the dung heap. And he will spread out his hands in their midst. And as a swimmer reaches out to swim, he will bring down their pride, together with the trickery of their hands, the fortress, the mighty places of the high Fort of your walls, he will bring down, lay low, and bring to the ground. He's going to bring it down to the dust. The Moabites, who are an example here of all those who oppose God, all of God's avowed enemies, even this morning, Hamas, and all of the avowed enemies of the Jews, 
Uh, Isaiah compares them to being like straw trampled down deeply into a manure pile. My father-in-law introduced me to a large manure pile because he milked cows. And I remember one time I had, I can't remember if it was my cell phone, it was something valuable. And I was milking the cows for Frank because he had three daughters and he needed some manual, manly labor. And uh, he hooked me in and I went into the barn and I'm working around piles and piles of manure on a cold winter's night. And whether it was my cell phone or some money or some, probably wasn't money. I had no money when we got married. So anyway, it fell into the trough where the cows are up, locked in the stanchions. Then there's this, this rut, this, this cement hole in the ground where all of the cows do their business. And it was full. And it dropped. And without thinking, I ran my hand down inside that straw and urination and malcontent stuff and just whoa, and before I knew it and he was a cook that water was freezing I was less disappointed in the cows I thought they would just warm it up a little bit but anyway I, I'm there and I bring that thing up out of the out of the darkness and uh, the Bible says that the wicked they're trying to reach out and swim like straw trampled down in cold, wet manure. And yet God, the Bible says, spreads out His arms. And they're trying to swim away from God. And yet He reaches where no other man can reach. And He snatches them. They can't run. They can't hide. And God will have His day of justice with all of the wicked. He will have His day of judgment. And He will unleash his wrath on the wicked. They're attempting to flee, but he said, no, you're going to be trampled down like straw in a manure pile, unable to escape. And all of your pride and all of your strength, it's going to be laid low. I tell you this morning, if you're in this place, our God is unavoidable. If you've never been confronted with your sin, if you've never stood before the Lord and repented, knowing that you cannot save yourself, knowing that you cannot have enough good or righteousness in your heart to forgive yourself of your sins, and you have been confronted with the unavoidable God, my plea to you this morning is don't try to run away. You can't. You may think you're hiding. You may be living in unrepentant, just rebellious sin against God and saying, I can still call myself a Christian and live like the world and lust of the flesh and the pride of life. But the Bible says that he who loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. But he who does the will of my Father, he who obeys the word of God, the Bible says he will abide forever. So I just remind you, folks, you cannot, you cannot get away from God. He will find you. And he has a particular set of skills <laughs> to know how to make you right. So don't wait. Don't wait till it's too late. The Bible says that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus... And believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. You will be saved. John chapter 3 verse 36 says, Whoever believes in Jesus has eternal life. Whoever does not obey Jesus shall not see life. But the wrath of God remains on him. So I plead with you this morning. If you are unrepentant before God, his wrath is going to be unleashed on wickedness one of these days soon. So get your heart right with God. Would you bow? And let's pray. And I'd ask the praise team to come. We're going to sing. Because God's story is great. We're going to sing again about His goodness. But I want to give you an opportunity to respond to the truth. And if you don't know Christ as your Savior and you need to be saved, 
I ask you to come this morning and be saved. You can come. I'll pray with you at the altar. I'll pray with you after church. But don't, don't, don't avoid God. Let Him have His will and His way. Father, this morning, as we think of Your greatness and Your power and Your goodness so evident in our lives, Lord, may we, may we respond to You in obedience. You're a great God. You are the only God. You are the only great God. And we worship you this morning. And I pray, Lord, that you would move upon this church family to just deepen their trust and their faith and their hope in you. We live in dark days, but the darker the night, the brighter the light. So may we be salt and light and shine for you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Would you stand and let's sing together.
soon. Sing it. He's coming soon. He's coming soon. He's so good to me. I'll praise his name. I'll praise his name. I'll praise his name. I'll praise his name. He's so good to me. Praise God from We thank you for your story. We thank you that you are unafraid, that you are unfailing, that you are unceasing, that you are undefeated. God, we don't want to avoid you. We want to rush into your presence. I pray your blessing. I pray your strength. I pray your anointing. I pray your power. I pray your presence, Holy Spirit. I pray for your mercy and your strength and your grace and your joy and your salvation over this flock. We need your favor. We need your help. We need your perspective. Help us, Jesus. There's people in this sanctuary today that have longed, longed to return here, have needed to be here, and they are here today in your presence. And ours is a great God. Amen. And we worship you and we praise you for you alone are worthy. And it is in the name that is above every name, God, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, our Shepherd, and our Friend. Now we humble ourselves before you and ask for your daily bread. We ask for your kingdom to come, your will to be done, and Lord, that all of the power and all of the glory will be yours forever and ever and ever and ever. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I love you all. I bless you. We're for you. We love you. Greet one another and uh, praise the Lord. Amen? Praise the Lord. You're dismissed. <laughs>